All right, you can turn your King James Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to look at verse 20 through 24. What is going to be left behind? Uh, speaking, of course, about the rapture, which is coming very soon. Um, if you're a post-tribber, <laughs> um, you don't know what you're talking about. And don't tell me, well, you haven't studied the Bible. Uh, I have uh, probably a couple hundred hours now of studies that I've uh, done. I shouldn't say a couple hundred. Uh, quite a few studies that I've done on the issue of the timing of the rapture. And the King James Bible proves conclusively that it happens before the time of Jacob's trouble. So don't give me your worn out little things of, well, if you study the Bible, no, 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 no. I have studied the Bible for many, many, many years, long even before I got on YouTube, and uh, the Bible is clearly teaching that the Christians go before the Antichrist even shows up. So don't waste my time, all right? Don't post your stupid comments down there telling me that I'm wrong and posting links to idiotic videos put out by Roman Catholics. Roman Catholicism does not teach a pre trib rapture, never has, never will, because the whole thing destroys their system. But let's, uh, let's read here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 20. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Talking about Old Testament saints. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, Old Testament saints, Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming, then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all er, and, and power. Excuse me. That's why back in Revelation chapter 20, it talks about this is the first resurrection. The first resurrection has three parts to it. Right? Old Testament saints, um, body of Christ, the Christians, and of course those that go through the time of Jacob's trouble. All right, and I believe, too, in the, into the millennium, if you study the thing out. But the first resurrection is not until the end of the millennial kingdom. So don't tell me that there's nobody resurrected before then. That's ridiculous. Why? Well, we know the Old Testament saints came up with Jesus uh, after he rose from the dead. So, and uh, the body of Christ is going up soon. But it's a really neat comfort there in... Uh, Verse 23, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Did you know that you belong to Jesus Christ? You're his purchased possession. And that's another reason that you know for a fact, we're in Ephesians chapter 1, it talks about it. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You are his, God's purchased possession. Now, if Christians could go into the time of Jacob's trouble, they could take the mark of the beast and lose their salvation. Read Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 12. You see? If you want the single greatest proof for a quote-unquote pre-trib rapture, I call it the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. That's more scriptural. But if you want a scriptural proof for the pre-trib rapture, uh, it's very simple. God's not a liar. God says in Ephesians chapter 1 that you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Your God's purchased possession. They that are Christ's at His coming. You understand? Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11, verse 12, talks about the fact that there's two aspects of salvation in that time of Jacob's trouble. Not true of today. But Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11 says, If any man takes the mark, he goes to hell and is tormented. Any man. So if Christians could go into the time of Jacob's trouble, into that what people would call the tribulation, if they could go into there, they could take the mark and God would be forced into being a liar. Because Ephesians chapter 1 says, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 11 says, if any man takes the mark, he goes to hell. That's how you know the body of Christ isn't going to be there. And that's just one of many proofs. Again, I have done quite a few studies on that if you want to see them. But there are three parts of that resurrection. Now, who is basically leading that resurrection? Jesus Christ. All right? We are part of his body. That's why 
Christ is kind of our, you know, Paul is our example, sure, but Jesus Christ is above him yet. Okay, the one mediator between God and man is the man Christ Jesus. So then, what's going to happen to the rapture? What will be left behind? Well, if you want to find the proof of that, I would say look to Jesus Christ. What happened when he died on the cross? It's going to be an interesting study today. Now, there are three basic theories. Now, there might be some other ones that I have not heard of. I actually heard somebody say the one time that uh, they believe that they're, you know, that at the rapture it's just going to be a bunch of Christians looking like they're dead just like this, you know, laying there and, and think, no, 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 can't be. Why? Well, turn over to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 52. The dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, no, we get changed, right? It's not going to be a bunch of Christians that the rapture happens and our soul and spirit leave and our bodies are just here on the earth. So I didn't include that as a theory because it's pretty easily debunked. But the three theories of, okay, if the rapture happens this year, 2016, what is going to be left for the lost world to find? All right? Now, the first one of those would be nothing. So what are you talking about? Uh, well, when the rapture happens, one of the theories is that there will not be anything found of Christians. We'll just completely be gone, right? Body, clothes, everything, gone. I'll show you the scripture for that. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. It says here, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, I've made this point before, but I'm going to make it one more time because I like to make the point. And that is, uh, was Enoch's translation, when he was translated, uh, was it superior to the original? Yes. Is this King James Bible translation that it is, is it superior to the original Hebrew and Greek autographs that don't exist? Yes. I mean, if there was a volume that contained all of the original Hebrew and Greek manuscripts, Hebrew for the Old Testament, Greek for the New Testament, if there was a volume someplace that contained all of the originals um, in one scroll or book or whatever, how many of us could carry it? None. Is this King James Bible translation, is it superior to the original? Yeah. You see, Enoch was a man that had a corruptible body. But when God translated him, when God said, okay, I'm going to take you from one place here on the earth up to heaven, that translation, he was better off being translated than he was originally. So don't fall for this lie that people will give you, these new version people. They'll say, the translator, translations are never you know, superior to the original. Oh, they're always superior to the original. Okay, I should say when God's behind it. Certainly there's plenty of satanic translations out there. Uh, all new versions refuse to translate the texts that they come from. They'll talk about Vaticanus and Sinaiticus or Vaticanus. Or, you know, they come up with all these little funny ways to say it. But the, uh, the two big Greek manuscripts that they will rely on are codices B and Aleph, B being Vaticanus, Aleph being Sinaiticus. And you'll see that in the footnotes. That's why I'm mentioning it. You don't need to know all this stuff, you know, to be a good Christian and whatever. It's just Catholic, uh, ridiculous nonsense, uh, scribe stuff. But they will talk about, you know, not found in the two oldest and best manuscripts. You'll see that in footnotes in these new modern Bible versions. And they'll claim that this is the most accurate translation yet, this NIV or this ESV or whatever else. And yet, somehow they won't translate all of Vaticanus and all of Sinaiticus because those two books contain apocryphal books as part of the inspired text. Not between the Testaments, not between the Old and the New Testament, as part of the inspired text. Very interesting. Very hypocritical. But now you say, what about this theory there? Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found. So it was just poof, he's gone, and everybody's going around going, where's Enoch? Where's Enoch at? 
I don't know, where'd he go? He just wasn't found. Okay, well, there's a problem with that theory. Um, does it say that his clothing was not found? No. Uh, in context there, it's talking about Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found. He was not found, in other words. It doesn't say, I mean, you, you kind of can look at the text and it, it kind of imply there that they didn't find anything of him. He was not found. But it doesn't openly say that he disappeared and his clothes disappeared with him. It could be that his clothes actually stayed on the earth. And that could be what happens at the rapture. You know, when, it, when we leave, it could be if I leave right now that my glasses are going to be laying here and my watch and my wedding ring there and my shirt and this microphone here and whatever else. I don't know. And let's look at the verses that talk about this. Here's the second theory. Okay, the first theory of what is left behind at the rapture is not one thing. Everything's gone. Okay, you just can't be found. The second theory would be your clothing. My body will be gone, but my clothing and other physical possessions that I have on my person, be it wallet or keys or whatever else, um, those will be left behind. Let me show you some scriptures on that. Uh, John chapter 20. And I'm going to tell you right now, I cannot be super duper dogmatic on any of these. All right. Uh, there's a lot of things the Lord just does not tell us. Um, and I'm talking about this stuff because it is interesting. John chapter 20, verse 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, John in other words, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. So Jesus is not there, right? His body's gone. Much like we're not going to be there when the rapture happens. Our bodies are going to be gone. But notice there that the uh, linen clothes were lying there. Let's keep reading. Verse 6. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Now I didn't read, need to read down there in verses 9 and 10, but I just want to kick this thing because there's so many false prophets out there and they will continually lie about certain things. And they, one of the big lie things, non-dispensationists non will, will come out and they'll say that uh, they were saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross. That's nonsense. Jesus Christ told them plainly that he was going to die and be buried and rise again three days later. And yet it says there in verse 9, For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Well, of course they knew it. Of course they knew it. They had heard it from Jesus. But when it says there that they didn't know the scripture, they didn't believe it. Okay, it went, you know, as the old saying goes, it went in one ear and out the other. They heard what Jesus said, but they were just like, okay. Um, you know, they probably tried to spiritualize it or something in their minds. So don't let anybody deceive you into thinking, well, back through the Old Testament, they were all saved by looking forward to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They don't know what they're talking about. All right? Don't fall for that. But we see there that the clothing was there. His body was gone, but the clothing was there. Now, if Jesus Christ is to be the first fruits of them that slept, afterward they that are Christ at His coming, then we're going to Follow his example, I believe. So I do believe that there will be clothes left behind. I mean, what would be the point of getting up there and, you know, here's a Christian, they got their pajamas on, there's one that they got a, a you know, um, 
they're working on their vehicle and they got greasy clothes on or something like that and there's one that's painting and they got paint splatters on there there's a woman in an apron she's been cooking you know some greasy food and there's grease splatters on what would be the point all right now i do believe that our clothes are going to be staying here on the earth but i believe it goes even further than that the third possibility first we had that there will be nothing left behind uh, when the rapture happens the second one is clothing will be left behind you know and you see like the left behind movies and things and i'm not recommending that i've never even seen the whole thing i just you know click through some of that stuff just to see what goes on um but they had this left behind movie that came out years ago that kirk cameron was in i didn't see the newest hollywood remake of the thing but they show you know the clothing and it's like neatly folded on a little stack or something and the glasses laid on top well no no if the rapture happens there's going to be a pile there okay a pile of clothing but I think it's actually going to be something else that happens. I'm going to show you the scriptures for this. I believe that uh, if you really want to look and see what Jesus Christ uh, left behind when he was gone there, his body was gone, he left, in reality, two things behind. Number one, he left the clothing there, the linen clothes, but something else he shed on Calvary, his blood. Let's look about this. Leviticus chapter 17. Go back in your Old Testament to Leviticus. Leviticus 17 verse 11. It says here, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again, and that is that John MacArthur, this false prophet out there in California, he said that it was the death of Jesus on the cross, not the blood. Uh, well, apparently he doesn't read English scriptures too well. Of course, he doesn't believe the King James Bible. He uses the new versions from the Vatican. And he doesn't really believe those either. So, you know, it's some unknown original autographs that don't exist anymore that you can kind of find somewhere buried within the manuscript or, you know, nonsense in other words he's just another one of the lying hypocrites that stands up in a pulpit and preaches out of books that he doesn't believe in but you see right there in leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 the life of the flesh is in the blood okay um if i was going to commit suicide and i'm not recommending this obviously um and i wanted to do it by uh bleeding to death all right, where would I do it? Well, you cut yourself in areas here or people will cut the throat or whatever else and the person bleeds out. And when all the blood's gone, that person can live for another three or four weeks, right? No, you see, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And where the blood is running through veins and things like that, if you get cut there, you bleed out and you die. I don't care how good a health you're in. I don't care how whatever. If you lose your blood, you're dead. All right? Our blood is the life supply for the whole body. Even if you have an injury someplace on your body, you, injure, you sprain your wrist or whatever else, you know what the best thing for you to do is? Move it. Massage it. I sprained my wrist a, a couple months ago now. I was I was working, was helping a guy get a this like side gate into a truck and the thing wasn't going out in and I took my hand and I, I kind of whacked it with the palm like that. And when I did, I ended up spraining my wrist a little bit and it hurt like crazy. And so, you know, I'm not about to go to a doctor or a hospital and, you know, try to drug me up and whatever else. But And so what I did is I just would exercise my wrist. And massage it and you know just go like this what am I doing I'm getting blood to the area and the life of the flesh is in the blood you see you get blood to the area and it heals my wrist feels fine now right you have sore muscles you rub those sore muscles why you getting the blood to go there the life of the flesh is in the blood and yet somehow some of these atheists you know there's nothing scientific about the Bible oh there's plenty of science within this Bible. In fact, there's plenty of things in this Bible that uh, modern science hasn't even discovered yet. 
Interesting. You say, well, what's the point? I don't understand the connection. Well, the connection is there. Jesus Christ died because he shed his blood. And his blood made the atonement for our sins. It's what we just read there. Uh, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Right there, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. It's a prophecy for the Lamb of God that would come and take away the sin of the world. And by the way, just to kick Roman Catholicism, because Roman Catholicism says it's not having faith in the blood, in the one-time sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, that that faith in that blood washes away your sins. Oh no, you have to actually drink the blood and eat the flesh. You say, oh no, they, they just... It's symbolic. It just you're you're drinking the wine and the and the bread. It symbolizes. They don't teach it's symbolic, right? You look it up in a catechism. It's there, the the presence of bread and wine, but it's in reality actual flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. That's what they teach. So according to Catholicism, you have to be a cannibal to be saved. Jesus Christ, by saying what he said, he wasn't speaking figuratively when he was talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. Oh no, he was speaking literally. Although nobody came up and bit him and drank his blood. It's kind of strange. He was right there physically. Why didn't anybody bite him and drink his blood? But secondly, if Jesus Christ was speaking literally and not figuratively, um, then he would have been in violation of three different places in the Bible where it says that you're not allowed to eat and drink blood. Kind of a weird setup that the Catholic Church has there. I'll give you the other scriptures on this. Genesis chapter 9, verse 4. Leviticus chapter 17, you can start in verse 10, go down through verse 14. You can read about the thing of the prohibition against eating and drinking blood. And also Acts chapter 15, verse 29. So you have before the giving of the law in Genesis chapter 9, under the law in Leviticus chapter 17, and after the law in Acts chapter 15. Three different places in the King James Bible where you're told, don't eat and drink the blood. Hmm. And yet the Catholic Christ, this false Jesus, this Antichrist basically, he has people going out and saying, oh, now actually you need to drink and eat his, drink his blood and eat his flesh. Literal. Satanic cult is what Roman Catholicism is. Absolutely. But we see there, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And by the way, another little interesting side note here is that if you get blood diseases, uh, there's diseases that you can get in your blood and everything else, it'll kill your body. Why? Because the life of the flesh is in the blood, so, could it be when the rapture happens, and here's my point I'm trying to make, could it be when the rapture happens that not only are we going to leave our uh, clothing behind, what if we leave our blood behind? Jesus Christ did. He's the first fruits of them which slept, and then afterwards, the day that our Christ said His coming, we're going to be following His example. We will be like Christ in the resurrection. You see, are you teaching this as a doctrine of the faith that you have to believe it or else you're lost and going to hell? No, I don't, I don't teach it you know, that dogmatically, but uh, it looks like it's there. I'm going to show you more evidence on this one. Colossians 1.14. Turning you to this one here specifically, because if you are not using a King James Bible, if you're using a new Vatican version, uh, you're going to be missing something very important from this verse. Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. The new versions took out through His blood. In whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins, is what the new versions will say. Somewhere right around there. They'll change up the words a little bit so that they can get their copy right. You know, got to do that, get that money in, you know. But uh, they take out the blood. Interesting. Very Interesting. But, again there, we see it's the blood of Jesus Christ that pays for our sins. Let's continue. Galatians chapter 1. Now, here's where it gets interesting. All right? 
Galatians chapter 1, verse 16 through 17. Paul says here, To reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Notice the very important key phrase there. He did not confer with flesh and blood. Paul calls living people flesh and blood. Acts chapter 17 talks about God creating of all, you know, all nations and things of one blood. Living people are referred to in the Bible as flesh and blood. Why? Because the life of the flesh is in the blood. Understand? You see, what's the significance of this? I was hoping you'd ask. Turn to Luke, the book of Luke, chapter 24. You need to see these verses, brethren. All right? Mark them down. Write them down. Don't just sit there and listen to me and, and whatever. I mean, I realize some people will take these videos and they turn them into MP3s and then they listen to them while they're driving down the road or whatever else. It's a little hard to be looking up verses in the Bible when you're driving down the road, but uh, it's important to get these scripture references. We're to be people of the Bible, not of opinions and feelings. So you check the scriptures, you search them, and you make sure that what I'm telling you is accurate to the scriptures. Luke chapter 24, verse 36 through 39. Very interesting here. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. This is after he resurrected from the dead. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. I guess so. You know, they're in there, they're, they're gathered together, you know, they're for fear of the Jews, you know, they're, they're hiding and things. And, and all of a sudden Jesus is just like, Hi, you know, peace be unto you. Just <laughs> appears. <Duh! laughs> yeah, it would it would tend to scare you a little bit. Verse thirty eight. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of a challenge there, I think. Um, you know, living in these end times, it sometimes is easy to get your eyes off of Jesus Christ. And it's just kind of like the Lord's up there going, why are you troubled? And why are these thoughts arising in your hearts? What if the rapture doesn't happen? What if we actually are going to go through the thing? Do you ever have times like that? Sure. Your flesh will attack you that way. But look at verse 39. Just wanted to add that little thing in there with verse 38. Verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see. He wasn't standing there as a spirit, in other words. They could touch him physically. But look what he says. What do we read over in Galatians chapter 1? Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Look what Jesus says. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Why didn't he mention the blood? Because the blood's gone. Uh, what would happen if there was such a thing as a person that did not have blood within them? Could it be that that's uh, your immortal body? Could it be that your immortal body does not have any blood in it? Could it be that that's why back in Joel chapter 2 when it describes the army that comes with Jesus Christ to go out and gather people for the judgment of the nations in Matthew 25? Could it be that that's why it says when they fall on a sword... They're not hurt. Look it up. Joel chapter 2. Minor prophets in your Old Testament, towards the end of the Old Testament there. Joel chapter 2 says when they fall on a sword, they're not hurt. Could it be because there's no blood? Could it be because Jesus Christ, His resurrection, was flesh and bones, no blood in it? And that's what we're going to have? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, but, but our science textbooks don't talk about this and stuff. Yeah, because science is very much behind this King James Bible. 
you know, they're always trying to find ways to prolong life and always trying to find ways to make man immortal or something like this. How about creating a man that doesn't have blood? That has a circulatory system that's maybe like water or something like that? Hmm, interesting. Of course, they're never going to be able to do it, so don't waste your time. But uh, just put your faith in Jesus Christ. You go to heaven, you, you live, you know, eternally with him. You get the resurrection body there. So uh, you don't need to rely on uh, your goofy little science labs and things like that. You get it for free. But uh, let's continue here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. Show you another interesting little tie in here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30 says here, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his, all together now, bones. Where's the blood? The blood was shed to make an atonement for your soul. We're not part of his blood, his blood covers us. His blood washes away our sin. Interesting. So we're already part of his flesh and bones. Could it be that when the rapture happens that uh, we're going to be leaving our blood behind? Just as our Savior left his blood behind? Interesting. And I realize, you know, somebody's going to say, well, yeah, but his blood was different. Yeah, I know that. I know that. Acts chapter 20, verse 28 talks about feeding the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The, the blood that Jesus shed on the cross was God's blood. All right. And you say, well, explain that. I can't for one second. You know why? Because great is the mystery of godliness. I want to just make a little statement here, which you can just have this burn into your mind and always remember this. Whenever man tries to figure out God, God messes up his mind. You cannot figure out God with our mortal minds. Not possible. That's why the Bible says the just shall live by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. You can't figure out God. Don't try to. That's why John Calvin got mixed up. Because he was going around trying to say there are certain groups of people that are not elect and they can't get saved. Why? Because God has not predestinated them to be going to heaven. He's trying to figure out God's mind. He's trying to figure out who God predestinated and who God didn't predestinate. That's why the guy was cuckoo up here. That's why he would kill people that opposed him. You know, I mean, I'll shout and call people heretics and call them names and things like that, but I'm not about to kill anybody that disagrees with me. All right? You disagree doctrinally with me, well, you know, whatever. I don't care. You know, you've got your own life to live. i got mine to live. I'm not going to form some kind of a governmental system that puts to, get to death uh, other people that interpret Scripture differently than me. But Calvin did. Good reason to reject Calvinism. But let's continue. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, right after the one of the most famous rapture passages in chapter 4, verse uh, 16 through 18. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3 says here, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Now, I talked about this in one of my preacher rapture moments. Um, I do believe that children are going to be leaving. Children that would be under the age of accountability. And that's a, a flexible time period. Children mature at different ages. All right? The age of accountability is when a child... In their mind, they understand, I have sinned against a holy, righteous God. It's not, I've disobeyed mommy and daddy anymore. When they can understand who God is and that God created the universe and I've sinned against that holy, righteous God. All right. When that time comes, they have reached the age of accountability. They might be 7 years old. They might be 11 years old. They might be 10 years old. 10 is the number that most people will say. It happens at different times for different children. All right, But I believe that children under that age of accountability, the children that don't understand who God is and that they've sinned against a holy, righteous God. And of course, you know, you say, what about somebody, a child that's raised by atheistic parents? Well, they're still, they, their conscience bears witness. God's law is written in their hearts. So there's, there comes a point in time when they knowingly go against that conscience that God has created in them 
and they will lie, they will steal, they will whatever. They will disobey the Ten Commandments because I believe the Ten Commandments are written in everybody's heart, which is ironic because all these stupid atheists are trying to tear down Ten Commandments monuments all over America. I saw here recently that there was a public school that had the Ten Commandments on one of, painted on one of the walls, and they were forced to put a flag over top of it because some student complained to some a bunch of atheistic Satanists. You know, funny why they're trying to get rid of the Ten Commandments when it's written in their hearts. Interesting. Getting back to what I was saying, I believe that children under that age are going to be leaving at the rapture. Now think about the ramifications of that. Think about what's going to happen to all these women out there that just their babies are their life and everything else. And this, it happens. And I believe that the, you know, when the lost hear the voice of God, they say it thundered. So it's going to be like a, the biggest clap of thunder that you've ever heard. Uh, we're going to hear a trumpet as Christians, but the lost world is going to hear this big explosion sounding thing like a huge clap of thunder. And we're leaving. And this huge clap of thunder is going to hit. And you get these mothers and they're going to think, oh, I hope the baby's okay. I better go in and check the baby. Now, if they just go in there and they pull back the sheets in the crib and they look in there and there's the baby's clothes, they're going to look and they're going to go, well, what in the world? Honey, what did you, what are you doing with the baby? Are you giving the baby a bath? It's not going to, it's not going to weird them out or anything, at least not at first. But what would happen if they pulled back the covers and there's the baby's clothes and all the baby's blood? Would that be a sudden destruction cometh upon them? Yes, <laughs> very much so. Little two-year-old, little three-year-old, four, five-year-old. Parents go in, are you, hey, Jimmy, are you okay? They flick on the light. And there's blood all over the sheets. Little pajamas laying there. That would be considered sudden destruction, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, could the Antichrist come to power after an event, an event like that happens? Would people be willing to join together with those that they wouldn't have done previously? When it's Roman Catholics that have had it happen, evangelical professing Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, all the different people, their children are all gone. Sudden destruction came upon them, and now they're looking and they're going, what happened here? Well, what happened is uh, they shall not escape. The lost parents don't escape, but the children do. Again, can I teach it 100% definitely for sure? No, I can't. It's a theory. But I think it's what's going to happen. I do believe that the blood and clothing will be left behind. Now, people will say, you know, this is another argument. They'll say, you know, if the rapture is true, then why would Hollywood make a movie about the Left Behind series of books by Tim LaHaye and what was the guy's other guy, Jerry Jenkins or something like that? Why would Hollywood make a movie about a Christian doctrine, Bible doctrine? Well, because they cover it up. You see, they come out and they make people think it's just going to be clothes left there. But what happens when it's blood and clothes? The people are going to say, well, this was some kind of terrorist attack or some kind of bomb went off or this was some kind of thing. Who did this? Who did this? Who did this? Look, you know, everybody's children, they were all destroyed in this attack. Hmm. You see? But uh, that's the first part of the message. All right. What will be left behind of the rapture? Well, I don't believe it's going to be just we totally disappear, clothing and everything. I don't believe that. I don't believe it's just, just clothing. I believe it's going to be clothing and blood. Okay? First part of the message. Now let's talk about the second part of the message. What is going to be left behind as a Christian, what are you going to be leaving behind? I'm going to give you three points here. Point number one, your testimony. You're going to leave a testimony behind, brethren. Turn to the book of, to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. I'm going to show you some good instruction and in righteousness here. Matthew, chapter 5, 
beginning in verse 14 here, reading down to verse 16, it says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You say, well, then I have to be a good person so that they'll give glory to God. Uh, no, sometimes you being persecuted for righteousness sake uh, is actually bringing glory to God. You stand by the book. All right. And when you do that, no matter what the world, lost world says, it's going to come back to God's glory. All right. Guaranteed. But you see, right here is talking about that we are supposed to shine as lights in this very dark world. And you know what? I've seen this thing many, many times. Lost people will mock you. They will put you down. They will uh, just do all sorts of terrible things to you. But when times get bad, they'll come to you for answers. They'll come to you for counsel. I mean, I've seen that thing. I have seen it personally. Uh, different people have, uh, you know, back when I was working and things and whatever else, I wasn't even really saved. You know, but I was at least morally a little bit better than the other lost children out there. And, and uh, I got made fun of in high school and everything, got picked on. But uh, things would start going bad, they'd come to me. There was a, a guy, one of my classmates, and he was having troubles with his girlfriend at the time. You know, all big troubles that you have in high school. But, you know, and he came to me after making fun of me and everything. See? And like I said, I wasn't even really saved back then. I was a false convert. But I had something. I had a knowledge that he didn't have. I had an understanding that he did not have. And now that I'm saved, I can tell you right now, there are people that will mock me and put me down on things, but I've seen it where when people know I'm saved, they'll trust me more. We are supposed to shine as lights in this very dark world. Turn next to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6, we'll start here in verse 4. It says here, But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, and in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by longsuffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. You know, let me just stop there. When you're going down through this checklist here and you're examining your life according to this checklist, it's not all positive stuff of you being a nice person and just getting along with everybody. All right? You're not going to get evil report when you're just a nice person. You're going to get evil report from people when you're telling people the truth. Notice it said there in verse 7, by the word of truth. When you hold up this book as the final authority and judge people according to this book, you're going to get some evil report. And why do you think Paul was uh, given stripes and imprisonments in verse 5? Well, let's continue here. Uh, as deceivers, verse 8, and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Can you relate? Well, if you say, well, yeah, I am going through some of that stuff. Okay, praise the Lord then, because why? In all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. Verse 4. God is putting you through the approval process. Basic training, if you will. All right? And uh, your training as a Christian, by the way, is never done. You'll get to a point where you'll understand the Bible pretty well, and you'll be able to get in good sword fights and things with people. But uh, you're always going to be training. Okay? Uh, it's a very interesting life that the Lord will give you. But you see there, many things there that you're going to go through as a Christian... Um, and if those things are, if you really can't relate to a whole lot that's going on, on that list, first of all, I'd check, make sure that you're really saved. But secondly, 
uh, you might want to start to get serious about your walk with the Lord because there's not much time left. And what you're leaving behind is your testimony. And if people find out, hey, wait a second, all these people that left, they all had this King James Bible. They were all Bible-believing Christians. And somebody says, yeah, but so-and-so was involved in that movement. They, they left. But really? I, I didn't think that they were a Christian. Is that the kind of testimony you want to leave? Or would you rather have people say, well, you had figures that so-and-so left. I mean, good night. They were, they were always preaching, always talking about this book, and always, you know, I always called them, said that they were judging other people, but now I realize what they were really doing. Something to think about. The second thing that you're going to be leaving behind is your physical belongings. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15, verse 51 through 53. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Now, I've done this in other studies, and I'm going to do it here again for illustration purposes. You know how quick the rapture is going to happen? Okay, it's over. So, huh? I'll try it again. Okay, it's over. One more time. Okay, it's over. Twinkling of an eye. Quicker than that. The snap of my fingers. That took too long. It's a twinkling of an eye. Um, are you going to have any time to uh, fill out a last will and testament? Or perhaps say to somebody, hey, I want you to have this. The rapture is going to be happening here in about two hours. Let me, I, I got to call my relatives here and get things lined up. Um, there should probably be an auction and there should probably, uh, I got to think here, who's, who would I want to have this poster here? You know, my banner here. And uh, I wonder who should get their time. No time. Um, then why would you spend all your time worrying about this stuff? Worrying about clothes and money and houses and lands and your new car you got and whatever else. Why would you spend much time on that? And you know, I realize that there are things that you need to live. I'm not saying just sell everything, get a white robe and go sit on top of a mountain someplace just looking up at the sky towards the north or something. I'm not saying to do that. Certainly not. But uh, don't get so wrapped up in the things of the world that you start to forget that the rapture is coming soon and it's going to be like that and you're gone. Let's look at another verse here. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1. It says here, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Just stop there for a minute. If ye then be risen with Christ? Huh? Oh yeah, you see you're a new creature. Actually, the Bible says that we're seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. Something to think about. Verse 2. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, get that one. Life of the flesh is in the blood. We are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? The old hymn says, Christ is our life. Part of his flesh and of his bones. See how everything ties together? It's pretty neat. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Well, there's no verses that prove a pre trib rapture. Well, there's another one. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear up in the sky there, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye. Up we go. Verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. 
fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. I mean, I'll continue here with the sermon in just a minute, but I don't know if you've seen the new 2017 Mustang, Ford Mustang that they're coming out with. I am just like, oh, it's, it's all I think about anymore. I just got to have it. Excuse me? I've seen Christians that are, that are like that. They'll talk about things of this world just like it's just, oh, I just, oh, oh man, and, and they'll have pictures of it. and just Oh, it's all they think about. You know why? Because it's an idol to them. It's idolatry. It's covetousness. Be careful. Why should you be careful? Verse 6, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, and the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Yeah, you used to be a, a child of disobedience before you got saved. Then things change, regardless of what some of the people try to say. Verse 8, But now ye also put off all these, Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. Your physical possessions are going to be left here, brethren. And you know, just as a little bit of an encouragement, I know some of you out there are have major debts as a result of uh, things that have happened, loss of job, uh, loss of, you know, you had a health problem, had to go have surgery or this happened or that happened and whatever else. I know, I know. I've written back and forth with a lot of you. I know some of you. It's just, there are a lot of problems. Well, uh, what do you think is going to happen at the rapture? Those debts and things and those bad things that you're going through right now? Bye-bye. <laughs> you know? Isn't that going to be wonderful? You know, right now I got a, uh, my truck is in the garage. Uh, they're doing all kinds of work to it and stuff like that. I have no idea. Hopefully it's not going to be too bad. Uh, I can do some work on vehicles, but, you know, I don't have a full garage or anything that I can work on things. But, uh, and my car, they're both older. My truck's a 1979. The car's a 1999, so I don't drive new vehicles or anything. But the car uh, needs work done. You know, um, somebody else is going to have those problems when the rapture happens. Again, as I've said in previous studies, this place here, uh, the ministry headquarters that we have, um, there's a whole lot of problems. And a lot of it I'm just not going to be able to fix because it's just not worth it. You know, it's just the, the money it would take to fix this place up would not be worth it. You know, so we just keep it kind of going and so we can do work here and things and, you know. But at the rapture, this is going to be somebody else's issue. If the rapture happens here in the next couple of minutes. Somebody's going to have to go out there and wash the dishes. I'm not saying let your dishes keep piling up and piling up and piling up. Okay, you need to do them occasionally. Uh, you need to clean the house. You need to, you know, whatever. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But, uh... Set your affections on things above, brethren. I mean, and maybe instead of having your house perfectly clean, spick and span to the point where you're just a nervous wreck all the time if something gets out of place, maybe I'll just spend some time reading the Word. Maybe spend some time encouraging some of the brethren, exhorting some of the brethren. Why? That's what you're taking with you. Spend some time with your family. So my family hates me. No, no, no. I'm not talking about your family, your fleshly family. I'm talking about your spiritual family. Reach out to brothers and sisters in Christ and say, hey, just want to encourage you. We'll take it. If you don't want to do it to anybody else, encourage us. It's a great encouragement when we get letters and things and people share with us their testimony. And that, that, that's great. Love to hear it. Keeps me going. But finally, the most convicting of all, the things that you're going to leave behind at the rapture. Turn to Luke chapter 16. And this is where we're going to end it. This study. 
Now this is instruction in righteousness. I know doctrinally this is pointed at something else, but uh, instruction in righteousness is definitely here. Luke chapter 16, verse 1. And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same which was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. You know, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. So in a sense, we're like stewards. God has given us His wealth, His riches in this book. The greatest book that's ever been written. What are you doing with this book? What are you doing for the Lord? I had to ask myself that question many years ago. And, you know, I could have continued secular work and whatever else. And, but I just kind of said, you know, I'm going to spend my time serving the Lord with what time we have left, however long it's going to be. I'm going to try my best to serve the Lord as hard as I can. Are there times I should be doing more for the Lord? Yeah. I'll be the first to admit that. But uh, the time's going to come when the uh, rich man, the king of kings and lord of lords, he owns everything in the universe. He's going to come back and he's going to say, Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. You see, the third thing that you're going to leave behind at the rapture is going to be your chances to earn rewards. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And our chances to earn rewards for that time are going to be gone in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Over. Get up there and you say, Oh, Lord, um, you know, stand there at the judgment seat of Christ and you say, Hey, I, I, was, I, was, I was busy working on that one thing. The Lord says you didn't get it done. You would rather watch things on YouTube. You'd rather watch television. You'd rather this, you'd rather that. And I'm not saying that you can't have any entertainment and don't ever have any fun and you just have to read the Bible nonstop. I'm not saying that, okay? I'm not saying that at all. But you know what I'm talking about. You know that there are times when your flesh rises up and you do things and it's just like, I really should read the Bible, I really should this, and I really should that, but I just don't feel like it right now. I have those times. I'll be very honest with you. But there's going to come a day when that stuff's going to be left behind. All our chances to serve the Lord, gone in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. We're going to get called before our master and he's going to say, give an account, steward. What did you do with the book? What did you do with the talents that I gave you? With the gifts, the abilities that I gave to you? What did you do with it? Something to think about. When the rapture happens, it's going to be a very, very shocking event. And I believe it's going to be the most... Uh, amazing event ever in the history of the world. Uh, even more amazing than Jesus dying on the cross. You so, say, what? What? There were people that didn't even know what happened back then. People in other countries, they had no idea that Jesus had died on the cross. It's not going to be that way when the rapture hits. Especially because I believe that the babies are going. Sudden destruction is coming upon the families that are out there. And the babies are leaving, and they're going to find blood and clothes. That's what I believe. Could I be wrong? Could it be that they'll just disappear, or they'll just have just some clothing left, or whatever else? Or I don't know. I can't be super dogma dogmatic about it. But boy, if it's true. If it's true that uh, when we leave, the little children are going, and there's going to be blood and clothes left behind, uh, <laughs> It's going to be quite significant. And the people are going to be looking for who to blame for this whole thing. And pretty soon they'll start to piece things together. And they're going to be thinking about you and me as Bible-believing Christians. And they're going to say, it seems like all these people had something in common. They all believe the King James Bible or the equivalent in your language. There's a weird connection 
between this book and those people. Maybe that's why in Revelation chapter 6 people are being executed after the body of Christ is in heaven. Maybe that's why in Revelation chapter 6 people are being executed for the word of God. Hmm. Could it be? It's really something to think about, brethren. And you say, how much longer do we have? <laughs> I have no idea. I have none. But don't worry if you don't have much money and if you don't have a whole lot of riches. You're going to be leaving. Don't get concerned and say, well, I just really feel dumb or whatever else. Hey, an old saying, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I will apologize to you before the world, Lord, that uh, there's been many times when I have wasted time. And uh, it's, it's always a struggle, Lord, with the flesh. Uh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, as you said yourself when you were here on the earth. Lord, you know what we go through down here. You're not, you're not uh, so high and lofty that you've never experienced what it's like to walk on this earth. You know, Lord, what we go through. And I thank you, Lord, for your grace that you have for us, that you put up with so much with the body of Christ. But Lord, I just pray that you would put an earnestness in all of our hearts as your children, Lord. I pray that you would put this earnest understanding in our hearts that we would understand that when we leave, we're going to be leaving behind our testimony. We're going to be leaving behind our physical goods and uh, our belongings, our possessions. And Lord, we're going to be leaving behind any chance, any further chance to serve you. I do pray, Lord, that you would please help us to get serious about serving you. And whenever you come, Lord, I pray that we would be ready, that we would be found working for you and not coveting and, and causing idols to be in this world where we worship these idols. I just pray, Lord, that you would help us all to stay focused on the task that's before us. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That is going to be it for this study. I'm going to be doing another one here on uh, what is a carnal Christian. Had this idea come from a sister in the Lord. Uh, very good question. And um, we're going to get into that in the next study. So please take these things you know, to heart, brethren. And, and again, if you've watched this study and you're a post-tribber, you say, well, I believe the body of Christ is going to go through the tribulation. You have been deceived. I mean, people say the pre-trib rapture is a lie and it's a deception. Oh, uh, <laughs> wrong. Um, this teaching that the body of Christ goes through this time period coming, the, the book of Revelation, you know, the, the time there, the seven-year time. I hate, I don't really call it the tribulation because it's not really a biblical term. It's the time of Jacob's trouble or Daniel's 70th week. But uh, there's, there's so many studies that I've done on this. Um, take some time and, and watch it. Uh, I've had many, many people that were post-trib at one point in time, and they are now solidly understanding what the King James Bible teaches that the body of Christ is leaving beforehand, before the Antichrist even shows up. In fact, we're the reason he can't show up. So, um, be ready. Uh, be found serving the Lord when the rapture happens. All right, so that's going to be it, and we will see you in the next study.